in my 35 years as a cancer surgeon, I have seen the war on cancer from very close quarters. The good news is that we are winning this war. But the unusual thing is, it's not just the science and technology which is making it all happen. In fact, the human factor is that core of each battle won or lost. In fact, I would narrate the story of Anukma, who was all of 28 when she came to me for treatment of rectal cancer. And at the end of the very first consultation, she asked me whether I can have the surgery the very next day. I was almost taken aback. How could somebody agree for a life-changing surgery in just one consultation? In fact, uh, she was had to undergo a rectal removal, a permanent colostomy, and, and the perineal passage had to be closed. We could schedule her for surgery the, within the next two days. She went on to have the full treatment with us. And somewhere down the line, by the time we had become friends, I asked her what happened at the first consultation. How could she take such a major decision in those 30 minutes? And she said that, in fact, before coming to you, I had already met three surgeons, and I knew that colostomy was inevitable. It was bound to happen. All I was looking for was a caring team. And in fact, at your place, right from the reception, the nursing staff, the coordinators, and then sitting with you, I found that comfort of a home. I felt that I can express myself, and I felt that I was being heard. And that helped her decide that this is the place she wants to go ahead with. In fact, she took it further and said that in the last eight months of treatment, I've had 55 visits to the hospital, interact with 200 plus of your colleagues at different sections of the hospital, and believe me, every interaction matters. Every time there's some hand-holding, there's some empathy, somebody listening, actually you feel that you're moving forward and you want to go ahead with the treatment. And every time there's a cold shouldering or somebody who's not having a superficial connect and not listening, at that time you get hesitant. It some way stops you from going moving forward. And she emphasized that it's not just that the hospital environment is crucial. In fact, the home environment is equally crucial. Your brother, sisters, daughter, children, everybody, the whole ecosystem engages and embraces with you in that journey. In fact, not just family, friends, the extended family, the social media today, every nudge, every call, every message has an impact on a cancer patient's journey. And she said to me, and wanted to educate me as an oncologist, that, sir, you must be very watchful of each patient's journey. We all need support during this period. Anupma went on to support the other patients who had to undergo stoma care, and she will help them educate and adapt and accept the new normal. Recently, I came across this group of stoma club from UK, who have formed a club. Everybody has a stoma, and they play football and rugby. They inspire people to accept the new change, accept that this is the reality, and move on with life. This is very, very important and very helpful. I would say that embracing change is an important way of life, Hand-holding for cancer patients is crucial and a important responsibility for all of us, wherever we are. In fact, I recall this young man who came to me about a few months back, and he shared that his mother was, went to, for a breast lump to a doctor in some other hospital some year back, and at that time, at the first consultation itself, she was told that this lump looks like breast cancer, and she will require a mastectomy, she will have to undergo chemo and radiation, and at the end of all this treatment, we are not sure whether how the result will be. This kind of conversation without the confirmation of diagnosis, without understanding the tumor, without staging, actually uh, distraught her. It was very demoralizing. She lost hope for any dignified life, and she decided no further interaction. However, the family could convince her to go ahead with a biopsy the very next day. Unfortunately, that it again was a horrible experience. In that biopsy, done with poor, improper anesthesia, and little comforting words, the multiple pricks for biopsy actually distraught her completely, and she was shattered. In that moment, she said, no further. And next, thereafter, for next 10 months, the family could not take her to any doctor. They could not give treatment a chance. The tumor spread from stage one to stage four, spread to the whole body, and we lost her. I feel it was not the cancer which killed her. It's a lack of empathy which actually pulled her down. In our life, even though with modern technology we are saving many more lives, we are able to save many more organs, but still, colostomies, laryngectomies, stoma, amputations, distortion of face, all this is commonplace. 
In fact, life and death issues are also commonplace. And I'm often asked, how do you handle so many morbid conversations through the day? Doesn't it sap your energy? Does it not take too much of your time in unnecessary conversations? I feel exactly the other way around. In fact, I feel inspired by my patients. I feel engaged in those conversations. I recall this farmer from Haryana who came to me and on every visit, he'll talk to me as if I'm God and he'll put me high on the pedestal next to God. And I'll say, sir, do you know what you do? You are an annadata. And no, there cannot be any act more godly than that. How can I compare with that role? I am doing my little bit in the world of science. In your world where you are a master, I don't have to different, differentiate between different gains, grains, different vegetables and, and pulses and all those things. And you are a master of that world. I am playing my little role in this world and trying to help you. Whenever I meet a teacher, a student, a scientist, an entrepreneur or an artist, I feel humbled. Everybody is doing their role with hand on the heart and all of us are helping each other in that game. And that is an opportunity which really helps me learn a lot and in that engagement I actually gain a lot. That engagement not only helps me in actually building a conversation which helps me understand the person, that person's expectations, the priorities and that helps in shaping the plan, treatment plan. We have to understand medicine is not about disease and body. It's also about mind, dignity, soul and all these things. And without these conversations it is just not possible. In fact, these conversations also help in building a foundation on which we are able to forge a silver lining for each person's journey. Without that conversation, you cannot build that. And that is crucial. I have seen so often that people travel thousands of miles to be with their dear ones in difficult times. Especially for cancer patients' journey, I have seen that people travel, switch jobs, leave jobs, take log blocks of leave from work to be with them. And in that moment of partnership, they actually rediscover relationships. They rediscover themselves and actually create memorable moments. I've had people who come and thank us for supporting them through the most difficult and most precious period of their life. And when that happens, I often feel that sometimes when that is happening, they actually find courage to go deep within themselves and ask the main questions. What is their really calling? What is that they want to do in life? And they also find the courage to do that. They create new identities, new goals, and pursue that relentlessly. I have had amazing experience in the, as a professional to see this happen unfold in, my, in front of my eyes so often. In fact, I must also caution you that there's always a risk of drifting apart. I have seen people actually falling apart. I recall this army, retired army officer who was treated for laryngeal cancer. We had removed his larynx. He had a permanent tracheostomy, and three years later, he came on a follow-up, and as usual, I was chatting with him. I said that, how are you doing, and other things. With my hand on his shoulder, I said, sir, with your sturdy frame, foggy training, tall height, even at 70, you can take on 30-year-old young people of today. And I don't know how I said or what I said. He broke down. It led to an emotional outburst. He started sobbing like a child. I was stunned. His wife was stunned. And everybody was taken aback. What happened? And then he said, with, with his electronic voice, Sir, I am a loner at my house. In my own home, I become an outsider. Nobody is trying to understand me. Nobody is listening to me, and I have moved on. But the people are all separate now. His wife was obviously very worried. She was quite embarrassed. <coughs> she took charge, and a few months later, the whole family came to us and thanked us for helping them identify their blind spot. The crucial thing is that unless you are aware, you will lose sight and may lose purpose. And this is very, very important. I have seen so many people discover themselves in their journey. No story about cancer can be completed without talking about Poonam Bagai. Poonam was treated for colon cancer when she was all of 38. She was a civil servant, had a very comfortable life. But once diagnosed with cancer, she lived in this mortal fear that what will happen to her children if something goes wrong with her treatment and something goes out the outcome. And with that fear, she completed her treatment. Once done with her treatment, she was not, could not shed off this idea of the childhood ch challenges for the children who are undergoing cancer treatment, the people around them. And this idea, when she could not shook off, shake off, inspired her to leave her job. She quit the job, a cushy, comfortable job, and joined Indian Cancer Society as a full-time volunteer. Everybody around her thought that she must have 
lost her mind. How can somebody create further insecurity in already uncertain cancer times? But she knew what her calling is. And that led to this inspiration. And her desire to serve the children, to identify the challenges, led to the birth of CanKids. And today, CanKids is the National Society for Change for Childhood Cancer in India. They are partnering with 125 institutions across 53 districts in India, all cancer treating centers, in fact. They have got MOUs with seven states to take care of access to cancer treatment for every nook and corner of that state as far as pediatric cancers are concerned. They have also done a terrific job by hand-holding 15,000 pediatric cancer patients every year, not just for treatment, but also for lodging, also for accommodation, transport, education, uh, mental health. All aspects have been comprehensively covered. So it's an amazing journey which they have created. I'm, I also recall this very inspiring story of Mamta. Mamta was treated by me some 25 years back. And two years after her completion of treatment, she had failed in the liver. The disease had come back in the liver. And during the conversation, we had to share that the life expectancy at that point was only about six months. Now, when we said only about six months, the only thought which hit Mamta was that what will happen to her dream of being a model. All her adult life, she had seen herself as a model, and now she is going to die without fulfilling that dream. That evening, when the members of the family went to other doctors for second opinion and finding a path for further treatment, she actually sneaked out into an ad agency office, office and shared her dream. And believe it or not, she got an uh, offer to do a campaign for detergent powder as a central face. Now, this is unbelievable. Somebody who's waiting to die or something, people could get shattered and she's inspired. She could break a new image in that moment of fearlessness. She, she, the image which she was holding back for 55 years, she broke that and lived that dream in a style which is unbelievable. I, even today, I feel very inspired when I think of that moment when I interacted with her. In fact, the Cancer Institute, where I got trained as a cancer surgeon, that was also born out of the courage of Dr. Muthu Lakshmi Reddy. She was inspired. She wanted to build this only when her real sister got treated for colon cancer in 1950s. And at that time, there was no cancer service. And she decided that everybody has to have a chance for treatment. And in that moment of darkness, actually, she put together four beds under a thatched roof and called it Cancer Institute. And today, that institute is not just the finest and one of the biggest institutions in this country. It has got so many firsts to its credit, including the first center to start cancer education and training in a formal way in the field of surgery and medicine. It is amazing that the way the inspiration started. And not just the cancer institute where I got trained, or which I called my cancer institute. I have seen so many institutions, including the Dharamshila Cancer Hospital, Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute, you might have heard of Gwalior Cancer Institute, and so many other places which were all have been born because of the dream of the founders who have traveled with accompanied people who are going through cancer treatment. They have endured that pain. And in that, when they endured that pain, they actually owned the pain of the whole universe who was going through the same journey. And in that, they found courage to create a vision and forge a dream of creating what was seemingly looks impossible. That is the power which they could pull together. I would say that in today's technological advancements, there's a risk of dehumanizing medicine. And that is where I feel it's important to understand, and I've come to believe this, that medicine is not about science and technology, which is laced together with care, empathy, and uh, 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 smile and laughter. Actually, it's the other way around. At the center of healthcare is actually sincere care, genuine empathy, which is sparkled with humor and with smile. Science is just an adjunct with it. And we have to remember that. In fact, I will call upon you that in your life journey, whenever you're faced with dark clouds, just take a step back. Look around. There are a lot of people in your similar boat. Think of the bigger problem, bigger picture, and help to solve for all of them. As you do that, you will create a silver lining for all of us here. Thank you.